you know, we were getting involved, me and Steve. We were putting a few away. And we were starting to have a good night, right? We got, like, pretty hammered. And then, but the thing is, right, Nesbury is a small market town. And this story takes place on a Monday night. We're starting to have fun now. Fuck. I was like, Steve, right, how about me and you, we get a taxi into Leeds, right, make this a big one, yeah? <laughs> Right, now, for those of you who don't know the geography of Yorkshire, um, the distance between Knaresborough and Leeds is a £95 taxi ride. <laughs> yeah, found that one out the fucking hard way. It got, they, they got me to Leeds, right, this taxi. They got me and Steve there, right, and dropped us off. And like, me and Steve were well excited. We'd been bored in the taxi and we were drunk, so we were excited to get home and start drinking, right? So we jumped out of the taxi in Leeds City Centre, and that was when we realised, because it was now midnight on a Monday, everywhere there was closed too. Like, everywhere. No one was, nowhere was open. Nowhere would let us in. We walked around for about half an hour trying to get in anywhere. Nowhere would have us. And we're like, we were stood on a street corner discussing our situation. We're like, what the fuck are we going to do? Nowhere's open. Are we just going to have to get another 95 quid taxi back? And if we do, I hope this guy has heard of Froobs. <laughs> right, whilst we're having this conversation, right, we're still, like, trying to work out what to do. And whilst we're doing that, a limo pulled up next to us around the road. And, like, the window at the back of the limo just wound down. A woman stuck her head out of it and just went, Hey, boys, how would you two like to go to a party? And we were like, Yes, yes, we would. That's exactly what we'd like to do. That's why we're here. Great. And then we got into the limo without asking any further questions. <laughs> right, now... Don't do that. <laughs> so we got in, and right when we got in, we realised this woman was not alone, right? Who was with her was the largest bouncer I have ever seen in my fucking life, and two topless middle-aged women, right? Because it turned out this was no ordinary limo. This was a car service to the local gentleman's club. And I use that phrase fucking loosely. <laughs> right, now, when we sat down, straight away, this woman, right, who had invited us in, as soon as we sat in and got settled, right, she just took from out of her bra, like, a little glass vial of cocaine, right, that had, like, a spoon built into the lid, that like, unscrewed it, got a bit of coke onto the spoon, put it underneath my nose, and went, do you want to get the party started? Right, now, I'm not here to glorify drugs, right? I think they do a good enough job of that by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially not cocaine, right? Cocaine's a really dumb thing to do when you're drunk. It's a really bad combination. Basically, doing coke when you're drunk is just saying, I'd like to make some bad choices, please. Quickly. <laughs> right. But, you know, I didn't want to be rude. She was being a good host, you know, when in Rome. <laughs> so I did the coke like a gentleman. <laughs> right, but as soon as I did it, right, the bouncer just made a little note in his notepad. I was like, <laughs> what's that? He was like, oh, you boys are having the VIP package, aren't you? I'm just writing it down. What's the VIP package? He said, oh, don't worry, it's great. You'll have a great time, right? We'll take you to the club. You'll see a load of women. You'll have champagne. There'll be more coke. You'll have a great time. I went, uh-huh. And how much is the VIP package? He said, don't worry, mate. It's only a grand. I said, whoa! No, 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 no. I am from Yorkshire, sir. I have just had a tiny bit of cocaine. I'm not spending a fucking grand on it. That is mental. But at that moment, Steve just went, why not, mate? You've got the money. The fucking grass! <laughs> Right, but the thing was, as he said that, the coke started working. <laughs> so I just went, oh yeah, fuck it, it's on the Arts Council! Let's go! <laughs> so, right, they drove us to a place in Leeds called Silks, right? Now, I'm already getting this vibe, right? There's a, this always happens. When you tell, like, either nice men or women that you've been to a strip club, you get the same sort of reaction, right? It's always just like, I just don't get why you do that. It just seems like it'd be really frustrating and gross and weird and awkward. I just don't understand it. And men will always lie, right? They'll always just be like, no, I just had to go. My mates were going. I was dragged along. Didn't even want to go. Bleh. Bullshit, right? <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, people. I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you the real reason men go to strip clubs, right? Here it is. The real reason men go to strip clubs is... You can't smell porn. <laughs> right, if you're waiting for more, that's it. <laughs> Didn't say it'd be nice. <laughs> right, it's right. Silks is not even a nice strip club by strip club standards even. It's a weird place. Right? I'll tell you why I think it's so weird. Silks has a buffet. <laughs> like, who's eating in a strip club? Right, if you are going to eat in a strip club, don't eat finger food. <laughs> I, and also, like, because it was like a Monday night, like, it wasn't exactly popping off in the strip club, right? The only other people in there, like, the only other customers were two elderly Yorkshiremen sat around the stage watching someone dance. One of them eating a pork pie off the buffet. <laughs> right, and the other one, I swear to God, flicked a 50p at a stripper. <laughs> a 50p? That's not a compliment. That's what racists do at football matches. <laughs> 
Right, and like, the, yeah, Monday night, right, not the best time to go to the strip club, right? It's not, you're not getting the A shift on Monday night, right? It's not a top quality night in the strip club, right? You know how normally, like, strippers will have some sort of fake, like, meant to be sexy name that they'll introduce themselves at. So they'll be like, hi, I'm Rolex, or like, hi, I'm Champagne. Right, I swear, on this night, one of the strippers introduced herself to me as Bev. <laughs> Bev! Like, who wants a lap dance off a dinner lady? <laughs> it's insane. Right, it's the thing, right? But, like, I was being well behaved on this night, right? Because all I wanted was a drink, right? And I had a girlfriend at the time, and one of us in that relationship was always faithful. <laughs> Sorry, next year's show. Next year's show. <laughs> Right, so I just sat at the bar and like, ordered myself a drink, started chatting to the barman, but I was like, Steve, right, we've paid for the VIP package, why don't you go enjoy it, mate, you have a good time, because I'm a good friend, right, so I sent him off behind the curtain into the VIP area, right, and now Steve uh, was gone for about 25 minutes, now he claims to this day, to this day, that he did not have sex with that stripper stroke sex worker stroke mother of four. <laughs> right, now I'd like to provide you with two bits of evidence why I think Steve is a fucking liar. Right, piece of evidence number one, when Steve came out from behind that curtain, he was kissing the stripper. <laughs> right, now normally you're not meant to touch, let alone put your tongue down their fucking throat. Right, which means the sight of someone kissing a stripper is very much the same as seeing someone in Asda putting out whoop stickers. It definitely means that someone has just popped a yoghurt. <laughs> <laughs> piece of evidence number two, why well, I think Steve's a liar. Steve's additional bill on top of the VIP package was £2,700. £2,700. I just have no idea how you spend that much money on sex work. Like, I'm not saying I definitely know what happened behind that curtain. I'm just saying that is a lot of £10 lap dances. Like, I just wouldn't have the imagination to spend that much money on sex work. Like, my wildest fantasy would cost about 40 quid. <laughs> I, like, when Steve was told this bill, he just giggled, right? He just went like, <laughs> I don't have that kind of money, that's mental, I work in a pub. And the atmosphere fucking changed. Right, instantly it just went, fun times in the strip club. To like, it was like the needle coming off a record, it just went, whoop. No, give us your money now. Right, like bouncers appeared from every corner where we hadn't seen them before, and they surrounded us, right? And it turned out the guy from the limo, very much the runt of the litter. <laughs> right, I am six foot seven tall, and I was looking up at a neck tattoo. <laughs> right, and like they had us surrounded, but they were all focusing on Steve, because it was his bill, and just like, just like threatening him, just like, give us the fucking money. He's like, I just don't have the money, that's insane. I've not even been paying for everything tonight. He's the one with the money. The fucking grass! <laughs> Twice he threw me under the bus! So they all turned on me. Well, the biggest one just grabbed me, pushed me against the wall, got right in my face, and it was like, right, he says you're paying, you're giving us the fucking money. And I was like, mate, this is nothing to do with me. This is not my problem. I was sat at the bar, you saw me, I was just chilling out, I did nothing. He went, no, he's your mate, he's your problem, and if you don't pay us, I'm going to go get a knife and I'll cut your fucking bollocks off. So I said, here's my card. <laughs> <laughs> But I turned to Steve and I was like, Steve, this is mental, mate. You're right. you, I can't afford to pay this much money, right? You are paying me back for this. Like, even though I knew, really, he probably never would be able to. He's always skint. We all are. I was just like, fuck, man. Well, I hope you got over your dog, at least. He just went, what dog? <gasps> <laughs> so I swiped my card, took my money, and kicked us out, right? When we were out on the street, I wasn't really feeling like talking to Steve very much. But I was also feeling very high on cocaine. So I wasn't quite ready to call it a night yet. So I was like, Steve, right, you've been a dickhead, we'll sort this out tomorrow, right? We've both been dickheads many, many times in our past and we've got over it. We will do this again. I'm going to try and suppress the rage. Let's try and still have a bit of a good night. Because I've spent so much money and I've not had any fun yet. Can we go somewhere else? We'll find something that's open. We'll do something fun. I was like, look, there's a taxi over there. Let's jump in that. Taxi drivers will know where somewhere that's open. They'll be able to do it for us. So we went and got into this taxi. And before I could say anything to this driver, Steve uttered these immortal words. Driver! Take us to the dirtiest place in Leeds. <laughs> and this driver fucking delivered. <laughs> right, because like, I lived in Leeds for years. I know the city really well. I have no idea where he took us on this night, right? He, he drove us to like the edge of town, to like an abandoned industrial estate, parked up about 200 yards away from a building. Just pointed at it and went, in there, boys. We'll have a great time. And like, so we got out of the taxi and started walking towards this building. And as we got closer to it, we realised from the flickering lights outside it and the neon that this place was a brothel. And I was like, 
Steve, I don't think we should go in a brothel. And he just went, they might be selling beer. It's like, that is a fair point. Let's go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so we went in, right? Now, if you want to picture this building, by the way, imagine the hotel from The Shining, right? That's basically what it looked like. Uh, except when the lift doors opened, it wouldn't be blood that came out. It would be semen. Oh. This place was fucking horrid. Like, it's the worst building I've ever been in. It felt like being in a horror film properly. Like, all the wallpaper was peeling off the walls. The lights were flickering. It was so grim. But there was a sign saying waiting area, like, pointing off into the direction. So we're like, well, let's go there. So we wandered down to the waiting area. Now, the waiting area was a room uh, probably about this big, actually. It was about the size of this, with about as many people in it, right? Which is fucking depressing for me. Because this was like 2 a.m. on now a Tuesday, and it was chocker. Like, I couldn't believe it. And like, it was a horrible atmosphere in there, though. Like, I really didn't like it. Like, it was just like loads of men, all men, all drunk and horny. There was this weird tension in the air. But God bless the British, there was still an orderly queue. <laughs> <laughs> All just lined up against the wall waiting to be seen to. We're like, and there was a bar. Steve was right, right? They were selling cans of Fosters off a bit of like uh, some beer crates with some tarpaulin over it. That like, you know, one of, I think one of the retired workers uh, was working that bar. Right, sold us, uh, sold us some couple of cans. We're like, right, what do we do now? Because like, like I say, I wasn't interested in any of the services there. You know, I had a girlfriend. And Steve had very much filled his boots at the last place. <laughs> So I'm like, what do we do? And he was like, the thing is, Steve's a really friendly guy, right? He loves meeting people on nights out, making new friends, right? So he was like, should we just go chat to some people, yeah? I was like, in here? <laughs> he was like, yeah, fuck it. So I was like, all right, fine, right? We went and started talking to people in the queue. Now, it turns out, people who visit brothels at 2 a.m., pretty creepy, right? <laughs> Didn't have the best chat, right? They weren't good conversationalists. After a couple of minutes, we were just being weird and awkward and grim. Like, I just sort of, like, backed out with the conversation, left Steve to it, right? I just left him there chatting away. I was like, nah, I'm not having any of this. And then I started getting that toddler energy coming back up, right? Because, let's like say, I'm excitable and I was bored. I'm like, ah, I need something to happen here. I need something exciting to happen. And then I saw a door that said, do not enter. <laughs> and I was like, hmm. I've never been in a brothel before. I have no plans to return to a brothel. And I don't know really exactly what happens in a brothel. I mean, I've got a fair idea, but like... <laughs> The specifics, I don't know how it works. And I have an inquiring mind. I was like, fuck it, I'm going for it. Right, and when no one was looking, I just snuck through the door. And I just came out on the other side, and there was just this long corridor with uh, old doors going off it either side. Like, it must have been a hotel in a previous life, this thing. So I had to come up with a plan, what to do next. I just went, fuck it, you know what? I'll just start opening doors at random. <laughs> right, so I wandered down this corridor, slamming open doors like a toddler with his first advent calendar. Right, just like booting them open to see what I was inside. Now, the first few I opened, absolutely fine, nothing going on, they weren't in use. One of them was like a store cupboard. But after about uh, five or six, I opened one that was very much in use. Right, and it was being used at the time by a very large, very hairy, very naked, very angry, very erect man. <laughs> The way I first encountered him was like this. And then he ran straight at me. Right. And as he ran, his dick was still hard, so he was slapping from side to side. Like he was trying to divine for water in a desert with it. Right, and I just turned on my heels and fucking scarpered, right? Now, I didn't know where I was going. I was getting myself more and more lost running down corridors. But, like, I was getting away from him. And bear in mind, at this point, Steve had no idea I was gone, right? He was still happily chatting away. Until he heard in the waiting room this noise. <laughs> As I arrived through the double doors to the waiting room, upside down, backwards and airborne. I had slipped just before I got to them, fallen through them, I did a pirouette in the air, landed on the floor, skidded across it, looked up at Steve and went, Steve, we have to leave now! And then I turned around and ran back through those doors towards the man chasing me. So I had no idea where I was going. I was drunk, I was high, I was confused, right? So Steve had to run after me, rugby tackle me, turn me around in the direction of the exit. And so we started running out. And that's why we're both running. He said, like, what's happened, man? I was like, I don't know, but there's a man chasing me and I think he might fuck me. <laughs> When we got outside, right, we'd left the taxi waiting there. So we ran the 200 yards up to the taxi, like, absolutely knackered, jumped into the back seat. And we're like, driver, get us out of here now! And the driver just turned to us, put down his yoghurt. <laughs> that was a... There we go. <laughs> Ten points, well done. <laughs> Rest of you, put your fucking ideas up. <laughs> we just turned to us and went, do you have a good time then, boys? We're like, No! Who has ever ended a good night with, get out of it now! It's been so pleasant! 
They're like, no, we need to go, right? Then I was like, Steve, this night's been a bust, man. Let's call it here now, right? It's been an absolute ordeal, right? Let's just get the fuck home, right? Like, I was like, driver, can you take us to a cash point? We'll get you some money and then take us home to Nairsburg, please. We just need to get home now. This has been ridiculous. So he took us to this cash point, right? He dropped us off there, and like I was like, he pulled up. I was like, Steve, right, I'm knackered from all that running. Can you go get the muddy for me, right? It take my wallet off you go, right? So he picked up my wallet, jumped out, and right, he started like putting in my pin. He was like, mate, it's not working. I was like, yeah, not, I've just told you it, man. Like, do it again. He was just, it's not working. I was like, right, don't do it a third time. You'll block my card, right? So I jumped out to go help him. And I went around, and I was like, Steve, this is your wallet, you knobhead. You put your card in. That's why it's not working. Uh, it must, you must have left my wallet in the car. Don't worry, I'll get it for you, pal. I turned around to open the taxi door, and as I did, the tyres squealed, and the taxi fucked off. Yeah. I was like, oh, and oh, you best believe we chased him. Oh, we chased that taxi with all the coked-up fury left inside us. Well, the thing is, Steve is about six foot five and the same build as me, so when us two run, it looks like two dragonflies fucking. <laughs> right, it turns out taxis are much faster than two drunk, lanky men. Right, so he got away from us. We stood at the end of the road, and then we both had a realisation at the same moment. We were sort of like, oh, shit, no! Because in that taxi wasn't just my wallet. It was also my phone and Steve's phone. So all we had left between us was Steve's fucking pointless, empty, moneyless wallet. And that's when we fell out. <laughs> now, I think I've been pretty patient up to this point. I think I let him get away with a lot, but I lost my shit at this point. Right Now, the thing is with me, right, like, I like to think when I'm sober, I'm a logical arguer. Like, I like focusing on the point, let's resolve that, and once it's done, it's done. But when I'm drunk, my arguments are like bushfires. Right? They start on one little thing, and suddenly they've spread to every interaction we've ever had in our entire life. Right, I was so drunk during this argument that I only remember two bits of it. I remember the first bit where I was like, well, how could you not realise that it wasn't my card? And then there's a blank bit, and then I remember saying, yeah, but how can Limp Biscuit be your favourite band? <laughs> right, now, fun fact for you, Dan. Um, Steve's actual favourite band are Linkin Park, but that stopped being funny just before Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Selfish of him, wasn't it? <laughs> no one ever thinks of the comedians. <laughs> so, right... This argument got so heated that eventually we were like, just like, we're just like, fuck it, right? Let's just split up. Fuck it, right? I'm done here. Done with you. Fuck you. We just left each other and we're alone, right? That was the last I saw of Steve on that night out, right? Didn't see him again. So I was left alone. I had nothing, right? I didn't have any money. I didn't have my phone. I mean, I still had my health. But <laughs> I was like, I'm stranded, how the fuck do I get home? But I could see Leeds City Centre in the distance, right? And I know that the train station in Leeds is right in the centre of town. So I was like, right, that'll probably only take me about half an hour to walk. By the time I get there, right, I'll be at a train station. You can get home from train stations. I know, train stations are very exciting. <laughs> right, like, I was like, yeah, so that's a good plan. I'll do that. Only take me about half an hour. It'll be fine. It took me three and a half hours, right? Because I was not walking as the crow flies. <laughs> But I got there finally, right? After getting lost for ages on this whole journey, eventually I got to the train station. Well, I wasn't quite there, but I could see it. I was about 150 yards away from the station, but I was separated from it by a very large spiky metal fence. One of those ones with the big prongs on the top, right? It went as far as I could see in either direction. It was probably about uh, nine or ten foot tall, and I couldn't see a way around. And I was like, what do I do now? Right. I can't go round it, because I don't know where that comes out, and I'll get lost again. I've been lost for so fucking long. Can't go under it. Can't go through it. Going to have to go over it. We're going on a bear hunt! <laughs> <laughs> right, now here's the thing. I can't climb even when I'm sober. I've managed to fall down three times before I got to the top. I was struggling up, but when I eventually got myself up to the top of it, I managed to push myself over with all the strength I had left in my body. I got one leg over it, and as I was hovering over the spikes... Don't worry, it's not quite that bad. <laughs> I put my other leg over, and as I did, that part of my jeans hooked onto one of the spikes. It grabbed it there, held onto my leg, and I fell off the other side, and I was left dangling upside down by my leg. Right, and I was upside down trying to pull myself back up in order to free myself from it when I heard the unmistakable sound of my jeans tearing both here and here simultaneously. Thus leaving me with four flaps of jean that dropped me out of them onto the top of my head, whereupon I bled profusely, vomited all over myself, and passed out for a little while. <laughs> right, now I've since learnt that those are the symptoms of quite a serious concussion. But I didn't get it checked out because I'm a fucking legend. <laughs> like, 
I've no idea how long I was out for, right? But when I came to, right, I blinked my eyes open, and all that was filling my field of vision was my jeans in shreds hanging from this uh, fence, like blowing in the breeze in absolute tatters, looking like a Syrian gay pride flag. Right? <laughs> so I had to, like, jump up, grab them down, put them back on the best I could, and sort of hold them together in a bunch. But I was there. I was at the station, right? And now, all I had was a simple task remaining to get home. Easy. All I had to do, all I had to do, was sneak through Leeds train station, the third busiest in the country, <laughs> at 7am on a Tuesday, in this condition, without anyone noticing, get through the ticket barriers somehow, get onto a train, hide in the toilets, and count the stops till I got home. Here's the thing, I fucking did it. I've never been so proud of myself, right? All I did, I didn't go subtle. I just grabbed my jeans, got my head down and fucking ran. As we threw the crowds, dipped through the barriers, onto a train, into the toilets, closed the door, and I was like, I am a fucking ninja. Right? <laughs> so proud of myself. Turns out what had actually happened was about 15 different members of staff had seen me. They'd just all gone above my pay grade. <laughs> and just radioed it in. <laughs> so I only made it about two stops when there was a knock at the door. It's like, ticket inspector. I was like, ah, shit. Um... I'm having a poo. He was like, well, you still need a ticket, which is a fair point. <laughs> I was like, uh, I've got one. Like, Can I see it? No. <laughs> it's like, right, we've had a report. You've got onto this train without buying a ticket, right? And if uh, and that is illegal, right? So we, what we need now is you have two choices. You can either open this door or I can open it from the other side. I had no choice. Let's right, so open the door. Right, now the site that he opened the door to see, I think is the most pathetic I have ever looked in my entire life. Right, I was sat in this tiny train cubicle on one of those diesel trains that still runs in North Yorkshire from the 80s. Tiny little cubicle, sat on the seat with my jeans in shreds around my ankles, hammered, looking up at him, and said, Mate, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a ticket. <laughs> But I've had an ordeal, right? I've had a hell of a night. I don't have anything left. This is my only chance to get home, right? This is all I can do, right? There's no way that I can possibly get home apart from this. I've got no money. Please, can you just let me stay on this train? It won't cost you anything more, right? You can invoice me afterwards. You can find me anything. I just need to stay on this train, please. And he said, not without a ticket, you don't. The job's worth cunt. <laughs> right, then he said, right, you can either get off here at this station or... I can call security and we'll make a scene. So I said, option two, please. <laughs> Pushed past him and ran down the train, right? <laughs> now, the problem with running away from someone down a train is trains are only so long, right? <laughs> there is a finite amount of train you can run down. And I realised this as I was getting towards the driver's door. It was coming towards me. And bear in mind, the demographic of this train was about 250 business people on their way to work and this guy. <laughs> Right. So when I got near to the end, I realised I was running out of, of, like, of options of where to go. I panicked, took my eye off the ball for a second, tripped over a briefcase, and slammed my head on the driver's door and knocked myself out again. <laughs> right, I came to, this time, being dragged onto a platform by the security guy, and then like, the ticket inspector just closed the door, and off he went. Right, the train just left. So I was left stranded on this platform. I came to again, got myself up, dusted myself down, and had a look around. I could see from the signs at the station that I was in a place called Wheaton. Right, now, if you sat there wondering where Wheaton is, have a fucking look at yourself. It doesn't matter, right? It's, it's a tiny little bullshit place in North Yorkshire. Still about 12 miles from my hometown. No good to me. I was still stranded. I was like, what am I going to do now? Because I can't go get back on a train. Because, like, obviously, they'll have told the other trains about this. They'll be waiting for me. I can't do that. What's the safest way I could possibly try to get home now? I know, hitchhiking. When's that ever gone wrong? Right, so I did, right? Turns out, very hard to hitchhike, right? People are not keen on picking up people covered in their own blood and vomit. <laughs> unless you do my tactic of standing directly in the road so they have to stop. <laughs> so I stood in the road in front of traffic, just holding my jeans with my thumb out like this. And then, like, a guy stopped, right? And I went round to his uh, driver's window, and I, I banged on the window. I was like, mate, I need to get home to Nazareth. Is there any way you can take me anywhere along there, right? I've had a hell of a fucking night. I just need to get home. Please, I won't be any bother, I promise. And he just looked and went, you know what, mate? I am going that way, right? And I don't mind taking you, as long as you can promise me that you're not going to be sick again. Now, that was not a promise I could make. But I made it, I needed the fucking lift. 
So I went around, got into his passenger seat, and like, I sat there, and I was just trying to focus on not passing out again. I was sort of lolling in and out of consciousness in silence, like resting my head on the window. And he sat in perfect silence too, where I started driving us. And the relief that hit me was amazing. So I'm like, I'm finally going home, right? This guy felt like a miracle. He felt like a savior. And like I say, we just sat in silence for a good five minutes. But he was eyeing me up all the time, trying to work me out. And eventually, he plucked up the courage, and he just turned to me and went, mate, I've got to ask, what happened to you? Right, now here's where I did possibly the worst thing I've ever done in my life. Right, now, like, what I did next, I'm not proud of, right? I'm not telling this to glorify it in any way or absolve myself from it. I did a horrible thing, and I'm not proud of it. I'm just going to tell you guys the truth, because it is what happened. Because I panicked in the moment, right? I was scared, because I thought, like, I thought I couldn't tell him the story that I've just told you, because I don't think it paints me in a particularly good light. <laughs> I was like, I need to find some reason why he'll be sympathetic to me, why I want to help, why he'll feel like a good person for doing that. So I had to come up with a lie, and I had to come up with one quick, and I had to come up with one drunk. So I looked at all the visual clues, right, and pieced them together. You know, the torn clothes, the blood, the, like, the uh, vomit, like the fact that a tear had rolled down my face in relief when I got into the car. I pieced that together, and I turned to him and just said, I've just been raped awful thing to do. I'm not proud of it. Horrible thing to do. But what he said was, well, how could you let that happen to you? It's like, oh, victim blame much, do we? I think you'll find it's never the victim's fault, actually. And then we went back to sitting in silence. Now, Dan, you think you're having an awkward car journey, mate? You think you've ever had an awkward one? Yeah, do you? You ever sat in morally indignant silence because you've just been victim blamed for your own imaginary rape? It's like, I fucking have. 35 minutes that journey took, silence. We didn't utter one more word until eventually, right, we got to like, my flat. He pulled up right outside it. And as I was getting out of his car, I was like, mate, I'm sorry, that was an horrible thing to say. I shouldn't have said that. Is there anything else you need? Is there any way I can help you anymore? And I was like, mate, you've done so much already. Thank you. Like, don't worry about it. Like, it was a weird moment and you panicked. That's fine. Like, you know, thank you. You've got me home. That's the best thing you could have done for me. Thanks so much. Now, I would like to meet this guy again one day and buy him a pint because I feel like I definitely fucked his morning up. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I got out of the car and I was stood in front of my front door and that's when the relief really hit me, right? Like, the, the tears just poured down my face because I was finally there. I'd been trying to get home for 10 hours by this point. I was exhausted. I was coming down. I was hung over, but I was there. And as I opened my front door, my girlfriend was stood right behind it because she was getting ready to go to work. That's what time it was. When she saw me, her face just dropped. She just went... Oh my God, are you all right? God, what happened to you? Jesus, you all right? You look like you've been mugged. And I went, mugged. <laughs> mugged. <laughs> mugged. That would have worked, wouldn't it? Mugged. I went straight to raped. Mugged would have been fine. Mugged. Ooh, what am I like? Ooh, what a Nelly.